Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Localization Fireside Chat podcast and YouTube channel. My name is uh, Robin Ayoub, and I'm joined uh, this morning by uh, a good colleague and a friend of the uh, channel, a friend of mine, uh, Benny Orr. Uh, Benny joined us uh, this morning from uh, Israel. Welcome to the show, uh, Benny. And uh, I was looking forward to this conversation for a while now. Um, talked to you a couple of times, I think, over, over the phone and I really enjoyed our conversation, and I thought a localization fireside chat with yourself, the audience will get a lot out of that because you're such a wealth of knowledge and expertise, and your view on the industry is very valuable to everybody. So welcome again to the channel. As we say on this uh, podcast, everybody in the localization industry has a story. A, how did they get into it? What attracted them to it? And I found over the many conversations that I've had, there's two categories. One is by accident, you end up in the localization industry. And the second is purposefully destined to become part of the localization industry by early age, going on to, going to university, study in a discipline that allows for the localization to become a localization industry professional. So the floor is yours. Welcome to the channel. If you don't mind introducing everybody to who you are, and what do you do and what's your story? Hello, Robin, and I'm very happy to have this chat with you. And hello, everyone. I'm Benny Orr. I'm from Israel. I'm a married father of four. Uh, that's, I, and I keep saying, by the way, that the best project I ever done is my kids. You know, this is the best thing ever happened to me. However, yeah, I've done I've done uh, a few more things over the years. Well, it's it's an interesting story. Now I deal I'm I'm, I'm acting as a, a strategic growth consultant for companies. I do strategic growth, moving to the next level. I call it sales development, and of course, mergers and acquisitions. I, I am involved in several deals, basically. In, in every time, in every uh, period, I, I do several deals. And at this point, it's quite even more interesting in, the, in this era of, of uh, change, of transformation. I started uh, age of 23. It was interesting. I had some connection with, 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 a, with a place that would ask me, can you write me a short manual? about a technical manual about a machine or something. I said, I never done this. All right, but uh, you can try. If it will be good, we'll pay you. If not, we'll not pay you. Okay, so it sounds good. It's a, it's a good start for something. So I did the manual. It was good. They uh, uh, ordered three more. And after a few years, it became the biggest uh, technical writing firm in Israel. Uh, I had about 15 uh, technical writers. I had editors. I had, you know, DTP experts and everything was there. And I was dealing with a lot, a lot of technical writing and of, not just technical, but also content creation and <laughs> marketing and, and other stuff. And clients started to ask, what about, can you translate the manual that you wrote into, I need to sell it also to my client over there in Poland, over there in somewhere else. And I said, all right, let me try to do it for you. And which I did, you know, finding for freelancers, trying to, to arrange this. And it became, again, like another uh, channel in the company. Over the years, I acquired two translation companies in Israel, and it became it became quite big. And the the technical writing became even the smaller part of the business, and the translation, localization, including software development and everything, became quite big over over the years <clears throat> until it disappeared. It was swollen. I, I would. Say, I'm saying that the, the technical or the, the technical authoring over here in Israel was swallowed by a bunch of freelancers. So the freelancers uh, like took control of this, and 
gave very low prices to clients and you know companies like us you know with quality control iso certification all these things where we, we couldn't we couldn't do it so business went into translation localization it was quite a big company and you know the change was coming from one thing i started to visit industry events i think the first one was in berlin lockwood in berlin something like that who can remember 2007 2008 i had a few a, a bit more hair back then and I started to meet people over there around the world and it became like uh, not a habit it became like a, a business understanding that meeting people networking and uh, becoming no other people and they know you beca- becomes like a like a, a business promoter for you which helped me a lot <clears throat> from here to there it became quite a big company and what was the name of your company right the name of the company was a uh, milim milim mm-hmm. writing and translation services mm-hmm. milim in hebrew is words uh in Arabic, we say Kalamat, you know, but That's in right. Hebrew, yeah. And in 2011, I had the opportunity to sell the company to Transperfect. Mm-hmm. The whole group was being sold to Transperfect. And I became, after after becoming the president of this really division for some time, I, I came to work with headquarters and... And I became like the uh, senior consultant for corporate development, mm-hmm. mergers and acquisitions. For okay. And uh, it became a very interesting, you know, the, the fact that I was developing my networking before and after that, I, I like took it to the next level. I met with a lot of people. It's like uh, the main the main thing for me was meeting people, looking for opportunities, looking for uh, for all kind of, of businesses, operations, ideas, uh, markets, everything. Yeah, which I brought I brought to to the company and helped quite a lot over there. Into we decided that it's, it's better that we will split our ways. And I created my own consulting firm. And since then, I'm helping companies to grow, to flourish, to change, to buy, to sell. Over the years, there was another, like, I would say, marker on the time, on the time slot say which was i i learned in in the university to become a coach and mentor Mm -hmm. you know i was i'm people ask me why do you need it benny this is you are you're a coach and mentor even since we remember you said yeah but the this 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 thing helped me to 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 put everything into the right drawers into the right tracks and to to fine-tune what I did and sometimes you know you're doing some things what you don't know how to call it they they gave it a name they gave it they gave it like a, a direction mm-hmm. and it's very good for me over the years I helped keep saying this you know smiling I helped a lot of uh, couples to get married I helped even couples to divorce and there was one couple, I did both of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? This is this is the highlight of this conversation, to be honest with you. I never heard of this before on this channel, but this is great. I love this one. <laughs> so the same couple got married and you helped them get married and you helped them uh, you know, split. Split after yeah, after after several years, it didn't work out for them. They were trying, but it didn't work. So Let's go to Benny, you know. <laughs> That's right. But you know what? You bring a very valid point because in business, it's the same way. I mean, you make you make moves 
to buy something and then you make moves to sell something. It's the same it's the same idea in the business life. I mean, some of those skills are transferable anyway. Absolutely, absolutely. With, you know, with my, I would say, uh, man-to-man skills or human human understanding, sometimes I, I can say humbly that I can see through people. People are like transparent to me. I talk to someone and I know exactly what is, how his operation system, operating system is working. I'm still in business. Business is my is my uh, focal point. This is where I'm, I'm I'm very good at, and it makes me more interested to work in. Mm-hmm. So yes, it's it's amazing what you're saying. I help a lot, of, a lot of companies to look for opportunities to buy companies to buy activities whatsoever, mm-hmm. and now I'm helping a company to sell the activity that they acquired several years ago. Mm-hmm. It's the mm-hmm. same situation. The same situation. Why did you buy it? It's not your thing. It's not your the nature of or your organization even. But you wanted to buy it. Now let's get rid of this. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you bring up a very you know you hit on a couple of points that I really like to explore with you. There is this notion in business now that says focus on what you're good at, and you know make sure you deliver what you're good at. But what you, you know, from the moment you started your company, the tech writing company, somebody asked you something to do, to do something, and you didn't do it before. It's your first time, but you were willing to take the risk and go get it done and get it done good. And then you build a business around it. I think if you agree with me or not, I don't know, but what is your view on, you know, do, you know, focus on what you're good at or keep your minds open to try to find other services that you can take a leap of faith, go do it, try it out, see if it works. Well, that's a fantastic, that's a fantastic topic. Uh, I would say I would want to take one word from this, what you just said, and the word is focus. And as a business owner, as a business manager, you need to focus on one thing how to thrive your business, how to grow your business. And if you have the business understanding and you are not afraid, or even the other side, you are brave. And if you can, uh, let's say, survive the, the, the feeling of, I'm getting into the uncertainty place, and I'm happy with that. You will succeed. You can, if if you have this, you can jump into new verticals, new areas, even transform the whole business into something else. Mm-hmm. And th- this is this is a very important topic. I'm dealing with a lot of my clients right now. Everything is changing. Everything is evolving. Uh, so for some, you know, if I say Chat GPT, they starting to cry some <laughs> are very happy to to hear this word you know that's right <laughs> yeah but that's why i bring up the question Benny, because we either as an industry we either change or die i mean i feel that way i feel like if we don't as an industry get on the board with changing adding services changing the process changing the thinking I don't know how long the old legacy traditional way of doing things it's going to stay around. I mean, it, you would agree that this is sort of like on its way out and a brand new way of being in the industry or dealing in the industry or selling services in the industry is being charted in front of us right now. Absolutely. So I would say that the following, the change or the, the, the ability to change is, is like a, a transformational action that you're doing uh, from point A to point B. You started the change and you finished the, the change and the change was done. I'm talking about something which has to be a bit more on the continuous level, adaptivity. You need to adapt yourself and to have the the skill set to adapt yourself on an ongoing process, on continuous process, continuous uh, evaluation of the situation, understanding what is happening and moving yourself, your business, your team 
towards this direction all the time. Generally, our industry hates change. I mean, I know I know you agree with me on this one. <laughs> They hate change in our industry. And so yeah. when we talk about a change, everybody puts a beginning time and an end time for that change. Meanwhile, a change that you're talking about, Benny, is more like an evolution, is a continuous change. It's being in an agile environment where your you know the the services that you're offering or the customers that you're receiving or the type of text that you're dealing with or projects that you're dealing with are continuously changing and adapting and evolving and therefore you need to continuously be in that frame of mind that change is not a set time it's more of a nature you, it becomes nature of the business right. am i correct you are absolutely correct and i would like to add a few more terms into this conversation The most important is mindset. Mindset meaning if you have the mindset, you can do it all. If you don't have the mindset, you better have that mindset. Otherwise, you will not survive on the long term. That's what I'm saying to my clients. This is what I'm saying, not just to my clients. I'm saying it to everybody. You know, I meet a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people, even an employee. Even if you are an employee in a company and you were doing the same thing again and again and again, you need to bring change. Your business is changing. Your, your, your workplace is changing. Environment is changing. Even your kids learning in school, they use different tools. This is a change. You right. need, you need to understand this change. Otherwise, you would stay behind. Staying behind meaning not developing. And that's the idea. You know, it's it's interesting. I'm 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 talking about uh, team members, employees in in companies. It's not not just in the language industry, but I see it a lot in the language industry with people which are working quite a long period in in companies. I see people working five years, ten years, fifteen, twenty six. Really, I see a lot of people there, and I tell them one thing. First. You need to come, keep, come smiling to work. And second, you need to keep bringing the highest value to your employer. Right. The highest value meaning you need to think, am I bringing enough value? Is he happy with me? Or this is, you know, I'm still here. I'm here for the last 15 years. So who cares? You okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely correct. I mean, and I don't know, like, are we different from any other industry in that regard, Benny, or the same mm -hmm. thing goes to various cross other industries, I'm assuming? The only thing which which uh, I would say is different in other industries is, for example, if you're in the gaming industry, gaming development, you know, my one of my daughters, she's a game developer. So I see I'm cl quite close to this industry, not just from the localization, but also from the actual uh, game creation. And people there are moving quite fast. I don't see people walking there in, in, in one place for more than four years. But all the rest is the same everywhere. I work with, with localization. I work, as I said, with gaming. I work with security, which is very, I would say, standardized, long-term businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's the same everywhere. Same people are people are people. No, that's that's the idea. But but you bring a very good topic. A very you know, staying motivated, staying excited about your job, staying you know on top of things, and don't think your don't take your your colleagues, your employer, your your job for grant for granted. <laughs> You'll never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and regardless of how long you work for an organization, or you work for somebody, or even for yourself. Um, I mean, if you are if you own a company. And it becomes boring. At that point, I guess, you know, selling or hand it over to your family or friends depends on the side of the company, a size of the company, it becomes it becomes it becomes an option. And it's a it's a style of life, I would I would say, where you know, you've got people like like myself, you know, still get up at 4 a.m. in the morning, hit the gym by five, and you know, sitting at my desk by seven. And there are some people like they don't want to do that. I mean, I want to come into work at nine. Because my employer told me to start at nine and I want to finish by four or five o'clock, depends on my time schedule. And that's it. That's all I'm doing. I feel like 
if you're passionate about something, if you like something, and that's why I was going to with my story about this industry where I found my passion, I think, this industry. I'm a technologist by by trade. That's what I did all my life. And I then I found the localization industry. You know, it's very hard for me to count the hours I work. I, I don't count hours. You know, it's very hard to me to not to answer my phone. It doesn't matter when it rings. It sits beside me on my night table. And if it rings in the middle of the night, I'm going to answer it. So the drive that I find, not just for me, I'm not special. A lot of people are in the industry are just like that. The passion that drives you there is is absolutely great criteria for success. And once you notice, as you mentioned earlier, once you notice that drive is gone, this is when we start thinking about either changing your job or changing the company that you own, which brings me to another topic, which is which is very de- near and dear to your heart, is mergers and acquisitions. As you know, there's like, I think research, CSA research pegs it around approximately 19,000 companies. So 18 and a change, 18,000 and a change in our industry, which predominantly is formed out of, if you take the 80-20 rules, right? So you've got 80% of the industry is at the top 20 and the rest of them are in the small to medium size enterprise. And with all the changes that's happening right now from a technology perspective, which is causing a little bit of an unrest, I would say, to some people who own their companies for many years, how is the market now, in your opinion? Is is there more people looking to sell or is there more people looking to buy? Where where are we if you if you were to give it a scan? Okay. At the beginning, starting around 2014, 15, there was a hype. A lot of people wanted to sell. A lot of people even uh, tried to sell and the prices went up. There was quite a demand and there were quite quite an amount of deals happened now i think people both sides woke up woke up meaning we need to understand the value of acquiring this company or the why should i sell this company people i i see a lot of people you know if if it's a small uh, family owned companies that are trying to sell the company would like to sell the company why why not because we can try doing this mm-hmm. and then they said they set a very high price for for that company meaning probably they are not ready or or not uh, do not understand what is involved in this the amount of deals is 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 way lower than the hype now but still happening still happening i hope to announce on of two of of my clients, one is buying, one is selling. It's it's really really nice deals mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. will make bring value to both sides. Yeah, yeah. Basically, basically, I try not to teach, but you know, to to inherit this to people saying, don't look for time, don't look for even money. I'm not. I'm a business. I'm a business development guy. I'm I'm a sales guy. Money is on top of everything, basically, or success. <laughs> but if if I cover it with nice words and saying the best thing is to bring value with everything, or everything that you're doing should have a value. Not necessarily a value is, is you can transform it into cash immediately, but value meaning you grow the company. You have the company do something better you find a better process internally internal process which is way more effective than 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 previous one so you can save money if you are a freelancer and translator or freelancer you need to bring value not just by translating but also by advising but also bringing new ideas like let's Combine this translation, let's do it hybrid way, meaning some human, some machine. Sure. And bringing value is is the, the thing in every aspect of life. So, um, yeah, and, and, and an interesting story, you know, I've, I have a lot of stories and probably I, I can write a book about with all these stories. It's... It's amazing. And I like to tell them as as long as there's someone else on the other side which is looking to hear, 
willing to hear. Like you're saying, I have a guy is in his 60s, he's managing a, a big department within a company, and he feels tired, and he feels bored, and he feels not smiling, not happy enough. And, you know, I found it very difficult to open him, you know, on one-on-one -on -one conversations. Eventually I did. I succeeded with that. And I asked him, what is the one thing you want to do? And you didn't do it. He said, I want to be a swimmer. What? You want to swim? Where? In the swimming pool. So why don't you go to the swimming pool? That's pure simple. I can. Okay. So we went to, we, uh, we, we looked where he lives online and we, we, we booked him to a swimming pool and we booked even a, a track, track number three at 8 a.m. You are going to be there and you are going to send me a picture from the water. How you're going to do it? I don't know. But you're going to do it. And now I'm getting a picture every day that he, every time that he goes twice a week, I get a picture from the swimming pool over there somewhere in Europe. And he says, I'm reborn. I feel happy now. It's, you know, it's a small thing that makes the change. So that's the. And, and you know, you know what, Benny, I think the whole uh, remote working has increased the level of, of stress on individuals. I know, you know, we deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and the nature of the work that we do as an industry, you know, very few people work from offices. Most of the industry uh, implicators, be it a freelancers or, you know, remote workers, they were remote to begin with. COVID did not change that. Uh, the people who are working for offices, employees of organizations in our industry are a small percentage of the population of who works in the industry. Because generally, in our industry hires project managers, tech people, etc. Those are a smaller percentage of the hundreds of thousands of freelancers that they work remotely, they work from home, right? Right, right. So even if I put freelancers which working according to per project remotely from home, a lot of companies that I, I'm working with, working on a hybrid or even a full remote setup, for example, I'm working with a US company. There are 200 people and they have in the office 15. All the rest are elsewhere, somewhere in the world. From South America to the Middle East to Europe. Mm -hmm. And it became, it became like a nature and you know, what, what is the trigger to make it, to change a company or to move from an office based to a remote? I, I, I don't even want to call it hybrid. It's more of remote than hybrid. And again, it's the same thing that we were talking before. It's being brave it is the fact that you can trust your people without seeing them, their fingers moving on right. the keyboard. It's about Trusting them, it's about believing in them, it's about not thinking in the value of time, but thinking in the value of value. That's right, that's right. And ask yourself a question as a business owner, I always say that. I mean, would you hire anyone that you don't trust? Absolutely not. So if you trust those individuals which you've hired, then they should be able to work from remote or work from anywhere they want to. You're interested in results, not where they work from. Yeah, but... As, as we talked before, a lot of companies within the language industry are like old fashioned companies. Right. And, and they used to come to the office, start at nine sharp. And after having a coffee in the kitchen, and this is the way, this is the way the day starts. Mm. And here I want to start, like you're saying, 5 a.m., walk until nine and then go to do shopping. And then come back, and still I, I've done my my day already. So um, that's that's a good, that's a very good point. Again, it's a mindset. Uh, yeah. the, the, the the pandemic helped us a lot in in jumping into this situation because there was no choice. No, mm -hmm. the offices were closed. But uh, nevertheless, I still see people that cannot 
about the change, and now they are asking people to come back to the office because their mindset, the manager's and yeah. the owner's mindset is still not in place. 50s. <laughs> yeah, yeah still, they are still over there. Yeah. I have a, f- a couple of uh, questions for you. I just want to get, gauge your reaction on them. You mm-hmm. have owned your company. You've sold the company and you weren't working for a large firm in a corporate development capacity. And now you're independent. You're working on your own. Which one is you? I, and I know you're going to say everything prepared me to where I am right now. That's the nature of a human. But if you were to just to look at it from a bird's eye view, like from a hundred thousand foot level, which one of those three stages, A, your favorite and B, you've learned a lot from and three, most prepared you to where you are right now? Well, you almost gave the full answer, but uh, let me try to develop it a bit. So I want to say the following. The first stage where I I, I own my own company, I was younger. I was eager. I was I was coming. I'm basically I'm coming from from the business area. I'm not a translator that became a business. I'm a business that became a translator, and this is one thing. So it prepared me to become a good businessman to understand the value of of a client. And when you lose a client over there, you really cry. You really, you are really sad because you lost part of your one finger of your of in in your in your hand when you lost a, a, a good client. So I understand it since then. I understand the power of becoming a, a good employee. So I cherished a lot my employees. So I learned how to work with teams. I learned I learned how to work with 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 people. How to solve problems? Like I'm keep saying, telling you a, a short, very short story about uh, two project managers coming to my room while I am still the manager, the manager over there, the CEO, and they were arguing over there in my room about a client that is asking this, and one says, "Let's not do this, let's not do that," and they were fighting. And I said, "Listen, guys." The best thing that I can do for you is fire the client because the client is making us trouble. We will have a much quieter life without clients. It will be much better. So they left the room and since then everything was good. So this was the first part. The second part, while I moved to to work for a big corporate, a worldwide company, basically everywhere, 110 offices around the world, and in short, I'm saying they taught me a good lesson how to become a, a worldwide businessman, to think differently. I took some very good, I would say, tips and tricks from there, you know, tip. One of the things that I keep saying that over there, the, the thinking of everybody sell. Even the cleaning lady there is selling. So this is something I took from there. And it prepared me, you know, this like the high level business, the, 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 the M&As and corporate development and dealing with big stuff together with my understanding of people coming from stage number one as a CEO of a company. All this prepared me to, to the third stage, which is running my own consultancy firm. Now, when I'm coming to a company, I have like a big pack of information, of experience, of knowledge and know-how. I've done that. I've seen that already. I've been there, like, you know, all these terms. I've really been there. I was there. So if, if we need... Uh, to find ways to be more uh, more efficient in work at, at work than I've been there. I've done that. I've done that over there in my company, and I've I was participating in this stage over there. I don't know in Texas or in Denver or in 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 the UK. And so mm. it's it's like uh, I'm saying that I'm coming to to now to a company with a very big toolbox. And I have a lot of tools, a lot of ideas, a lot of 
experience. And the most important thing is is the is the backpack I'm having on my back with a lot of stories, a lot of a, a lot of experiences, small experiences that I can share people with. And I talk about like I'm telling you here a lot of small stories. Same, I do the same over there, and people like to connect to the human side of the stories. It's not just you need to sell more. Yeah, it's about let's understand how to sell more. And I give you a story. I did this. I did that. I was participating. I heard about this. I heard about that. And this is helping people to to have the to get into the mindset to be there, to acquire the mindset. And the most important thing, to feel it's their own. And so from what I'm understanding here is you, you know, from a consulting perspective, what prepared you where you are right now is all the uh, experiences that you've went through uh, when you owned your business, when you worked for a large organization, which gave you the toolbox to allow you to offer this to your current customer. Now, tell me a little bit about your current practice. <clears throat> Do you have anybody in your team? Is it just you? How big is your consulting practice? I have a team. I have a small team. The small team helps me a lot in the background with, for example, when I need to prepare a business presentation. It's really easy. I just give the, the instructions and I get it. Get it done? Because because I have, I get it done because I have people that understand exactly what what I'm what looking for. Yeah, I I also have, I also when I need to do a, a big, larger scale projects, I have people that are coming with me to to work together with big teams. It's a team of five people, so it's not big, but still, every one of them is, I would say. It's not that I selected them; like they've been selected by, by the world. It's been, they've been selected by by yep. the situation, and it leads me to another thinking that I'm having. You know, one of the things that I try to inherit to people and to to teach them is one, and it's one of the biggest malfunctions in companies is selecting the right people to the right. The right jobs. The right jobs. <laughs> and to managers and to CEO, I say something which is frightening some of them is surround yourself with people which are better than you. Why? I'm the best. I am the biggest. I am the I'm the king. Oh uh, my no. goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You now you're getting after their egos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So ego, yeah, ego is a uh, Number one barrier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, a lot of my, you know, and I, we've had uh, several discussions on consulting in, in our industry. And I've noticed some, you know, I would say, relatively young, younger uh, crowd is moving to that consulting space, if you will, from our industry. And the biggest question is everybody faces when they decide I want to go down that direction is, and, and I'm, you know, I'm hoping that I can get some clarity from you is that, you know, how do I quantify my experiences? How do I share those experiences? I know I have a lot of knowledge. I know I have a lot of things to offer, but how do I package them to make sure that somebody could take advantage of them? That's the value that you mentioned earlier. How do I create value around this? and quantify it so some other people can say, okay, I want to hire Benny. It's, it's, I'm going to hire him for X, Y, Z, and this is going to cost me X. How, did, you, did you have to go through this, and how did you deal with it? Yeah, so I see I see this trend of younger people coming into, into the consultancy area. <sighs> there are two things in consultancy. One thing is selling your consultancy to other. And second, is bringing them the, the actual value that you said that you're going to bring them. Selling is, 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 is important, but the more important is, is the fact that you need to show them the value. And I, I keep saying that I need to bring value 
to my clients in everything that I'm doing, in every conversation, in every email, in every meeting, in everything that I'm doing, there's need to be value over there. And it's the value for them, meaning that they got something out of it. And if they want to get, if they, if the, the, the thing to, to understand if the value that you brought is, is a real value or just, you know, not a yeah. just color, it's a real thing, is that you see results coming out of it. That's right. So when I'm saying only results matter, I'm not becoming, I, I'm, I'm not trying to become rude and say, I don't care about everything. I just want to see the results. It's not like that. I need to bring you to help you to come to, to get the results mm -hmm. by yourself. And if you are a consultant with enough experience, enough understanding of the humankind and human people, and you can contain huge amount of different people, different mindset, different experiences, and you can teach them and you can train them, you can mentor them, then you're eligible to do it. There's no school for this. Maybe there are some, some, some university courses how to become an MA expert. Yeah. But it's, it's not a, but basically all MAs are not a, a matter of numbers. For this, we have accountants and lawyers. Uh, it's a matter of people. And yeah. you need to have the, 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 let's say, the people mind. You need to be a businessman with a people mindset. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. If you have this, you'll be a good consultant. That's right. And, and you know, for our audience who are in that space of, of being a consultant, I'm assuming there is some cooperation between consultants, right? Because a lot of times, a lot of times things come in to a consultant project or, or, or something to do where, you know, somebody is faced with saying, you know what, I may not have all the skills necessary here and there's nothing wrong by saying that. And I'm going to, you know, reach out to my colleague who is a consultant as well, and I'm going to cooperate on this particular project. Does this happen or am I yeah. wrong on this one? It happens as long as long as no one steps on other one other one's toes. That's the idea. You got a clear uh, definition, right? Yeah, it happens. I, I'm I'm using this as well. The way you know, I try to bring the maximum value to a client at the beginning. He needs to get he's paying at the beginning a bit more. For example, while I'm doing a workshop, a five day workshop for a client, I come on site to the client and. It's a very highly intense workshop starting at Monday 9 a.m. and finishing yep. on Friday evening. No breaks. No breaks. It's it's highly intensive. Yep. And in these five days, he needs to get a lot of a lot of insights, a lot of understandings, a lot of thinkings, a lot of lights showing him the way. Sometimes when I come to this situation where I think that I need someone which is better than me or have more views of things. For example, sometimes I use people to, to talk about high-level production. Sometimes I bring people to help me with, uh, I would say, sales. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of sales and I'm bringing a lot of uh, insights and I train a lot of sales departments in, into doing the right thing. However, sometimes there is a need to give them like a course, to give them a short period, two day of, of, of training, specific training. So I bring other people to do it. Yeah. And it is, it is really, really helpful and, and beneficial for everyone. It's very good to see the cooperation. I mean, at the end of the day, not in our just in our industry, I mean, everybody. I mean, look at the top consulting companies in the world. They do cooperate in a lot of cases as well. So, and as you mentioned earlier, you may have, you know, the know-how, but sometimes you don't have enough hands to do the work that is required to do within the timeline required, right? So this is where you, this is where you end up uh, cooperating. Am I correct? Yeah, you're correct. And even... I would say bringing the maximum value to a client, I need to use my own terms that I am giving them, which is 
surround yourself with people which are better than you. Meaning I can bring someone who is better than me in a specific area and he will give them the maximum value they can get in the shortest time. And that's the idea. And, and, and you know, I would love uh, to uh, this, this, I have like, so many questions, but I'm being selective with my questions to you. So one of the questions that everybody's on everybody's mind is before you head into the area of discussing, like from a consultant point of view, discussing like, oh, I want to do sell my company or I want to buy another company, the evaluation that takes place between organic growth versus acquisition. Have you helped people crystallize the idea of organic versus versus acquisition? And why would somebody select one versus the other and maybe a combination of two? I don't remember any of my clients in the last five years that I did not deal with this question, meaning I dealt with it everywhere. This is one of the first questions coming. Uh, Let's grow the company and then sell it. Or I would like to sell it and then see what happens. Things like that. And basically, my approach is, all right, let's start to analyze. Let's start to think, to brainstorm. And we start doing this together. And in most cases, people are looking, in most cases, not in all of them, people are looking for a miracle. And the miracle is, I need to sell the company and I get a few millions and everything will be okay. And then I retire. I say, okay, let's, okay, let's look at the company. Can we sell it? Is it ready for sale? It's not probably ready. So we need to do a few things before. And then we start doing a few things. And then the guy says, why should I sell it? It became like a diamond. It it works now. diamond. <laughs> I don't want to sell it. Of course you don't. <laughs> but there are people that come to this process ready and mature and cooked. So we sell the company. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now, any any other learnings that, you know, it was such a revelation for you to find out. And it, one of the things that I, you know, I, you know, before we before you answer this question is I always ask people is two things. What is the biggest opportunity that you see? In, the, in our industry, and what keeps you up at night? Like, what is the nightmare versus what is the positive? <laughs> I'm trying to think about the, the nightmare first, but I can't. I sleep like a baby, so I don't have nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would say that the biggest opportunity is now, um, or the, the challenge is the technological change like the AI, everybody using this term, uh, and it's influence about the, inf- the, the industry. It's the first, the, the most difficult influence is what does it influence the clients? And they think they can use Google Translate for everything now, which is not the case. Maybe it's a case uh, in, in specific in, in specific uh, projects or specific clients, but it's not for everyone. So what is the real up, updated value that an LSP, a language service provider, can bring to his clients and still thrive and develop and grow? Two things. Basically, it's adapting and not fighting, adapting the technology and trying to bring higher value than, than, than before to clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second thing w- may be probably the um, ability to uh, foster new ideas and new verticals that are coming. For example, localization company that deals with a lot of they deal with localization and translation. Uh, probably AI will take a part of it. So, what's the next era? The next era is again coming to become content creation. So, content creation. In, even in, in the in the last event I was participating in a month ago. There was a say there which I, which I embarrass, embrace is content creation is the superset of localization. 
So companies that are dealing with localization and have big teams, and they do transcreation, they now can move slowly or not slowly into content creation, and it will bring the value that their clients are looking for. That's right. I think I think on our side, from a localization industry, we need to start looking at ourselves as a knowledge-based industry versus a localization industry. And I've done a, a, a panel discussion on this topic on this channel, and it was quite intriguing because when you start expanding the horizon of what we do as, as, as an industry and you start touching a variety of other jurisdiction in the knowledge-based industry, you see the huge opportunity that's awaited us. And I always love to give this example, you know, a, a pharmaceutical company, you know, commissioned to build a somebody to build a website for them. They pay a couple of million dollars to build the website. And just a few days before they launch, they remember they have to translate it. They pick up, you know, the content, they send it to a translation company who they pay about $10,000 to get it translated. And therefore, the knowledge base industry in general for the size of this particular project was like $3 million. And the localization base industry got $10,000 out of it. So if you bring it down to like those kinds of small logical examples, I think the piece of pie gets expanded. Absolutely. Absolutely. But people start to understand or, or be becoming more understandable now because the like the, the change, you know, when when again I still give this example when machine translation entered into our life. People thought, well, no, everything is over. Let's close the company and go home. It's not like that. No, Benny, they did the same thing when Trados came out. They yeah. did the when Logos came out. It's like our industry, every time there's a new thing coming up, it's just like gloom and doom before we even figure it out. Right, right. So, so yes, so... There is like th this transformation, this this movement towards, as you say, becoming more of a knowledge base and understanding the client needs better and probably client needs a different type of value. Right. And if you are adaptive enough yeah. and you understand, you're bringing this value and you'll be there. 100%. So, hey, I want to thank you so much for this conversation today. We're just coming up to the hour here. Uh, before I wrap it up, any final thoughts, any advice that you'd like to share uh, with the larger audience when it comes to M&A, anything that comes to mind? Yes. Uh, one thing. I would say the following. Do not afraid. Do not afraid to do, to try, to check, to fail, to succeed. Do not afraid. If you do not afraid, you'll do it. Absolutely. And thank you for those uh, kind uh, words of wisdom. Uh, very well said, very well put. Uh, and it summarizes really everything that's going on in the industry as we are today. Uh, so I want to thank you on behalf of the audience, on behalf of myself, on behalf of the channel, for coming online with me this morning, uh, Benny, much appreciated. You welcome back anytime. This channel is yours. Anytime you have something new to share, I'd love to uh, have that conversation with you. I'd love to bring you back on board here with us. Thanks again to our audience for listening in this morning, and thanks to everybody for tuning in. And uh, hopefully, you know, as you listen into the podcast and the YouTube channel, although Benny and I were having a casual conversation this morning, I hope you found some gems in this conversation, some advice that you can take, you can action in your business and you action in your life. And thanks again for everybody. And thank you, Benny, for joining me this morning. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And let's uh, make a better world. Absolutely. Thank you, Benny. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.